All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, just a word about our next uh, Nanoet Tech seminar, which will be on uh, two weeks on February 27th. Uh, and our speaker will be Professor Farouk Ayazi uh, from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Georgia Tech. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have with us today uh, Professor Shuman Dada, also from Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, Shuman got his bachelor's degree in Electrical Engineering at uh, Indian Institute of Technology uh, and then came to the University of Cincinnati to get his PhD in, in ECE. Um, he spent eight years at Intel as a principal research engineer uh, then was a professor of electrical engineering at Penn State uh, before becoming the Stinson Professor of Nanotechnology at Notre Dame, uh, and then finally coming, making his way to Georgia Tech, where he is currently the Joseph M. Pettit Chair and uh, GRA Eminent Scholar. He's a fellow of IEEE uh, and the National Academy of Inventors, uh, among uh, many other honors and awards. And I think I've been trying to get you to do this since probably the day you, you stepped on the campus. So it's a, a real pleasure to welcome you to Nanoit Tech. Thank you again for uh, coming to this uh, seminar. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Suman, and uh, it's been about a little more than a year for me on this campus. Uh, the first thing I have to say that I'm so glad that I could escape the, the, the harsh cold winter of Midwest and uh, Pennsylvania. I guess Pennsylvania is close to Midwest, and um, being here in warm southern Georgia, that's a, that's a real benefit here. But most importantly, I'm here because there's a, all kinds of great collaborators here at Georgia Tech I've been working with for quite a while. And we can find expertise all across the board here. Um, so the title of my talk today is Plenty of Room at the Top and Bottom. And, uh, and you will see what I mean by that uh, as we work through this uh, talk. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm very lucky uh, to have started my career um, at actually, after my PhD, went to Intel, the transistor R&D team. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the innovations that just happened in the last um, uh, 20 years or so, <clears throat> all the way from R&D to pathfinding to technology development and then high volume uh, manufacturing, and how that shaped a lot of uh, uh, my research uh, uh, portfolio going forward in terms of uh, how we can continue to add value uh, to this incredible industry. You know, there are some projections that semiconductor industry will get to a trillion dollar by 2030. So, so that's great news for all of you guys who work in this, in this area. And, but there will be some ups and downs just like any industry, but generally we are in a very, very healthy uh, place. <clears throat> So um, I can tell you that particularly I target this talk to students. And uh, it was year more, more mid 90s to late 90s. I was in grad school. And I was seeing uh, consolidation happening in the semiconductor industry. Today, you know, the, President Biden had that uh, two years back, had this flagship Chips Act, Chips and Science Act of America. And one of the issues for that was that our share, the United States share, in, uh, in worldwide global semiconductor manufacturing has dropped to 10%. So we produce 10% of the leading edge ICs in this country, and the 90% is done somewhere else, mostly, mostly um, Southeast Asia. Uh, this started, this is not a recent thing. This started actually in the mid-90s. I was in grad school, and I was seeing that most, many companies, semiconductor companies, were starting to say that, hey, we're not going to do this CMOS uh, scaling anymore, and we're going to keep. So I was a little bit scared, and I, as a backup, I started taking classes in computer engineering, trying to learn more software. And, uh, but somehow, my passion has always been in devices, so I stuck with it. And at that time, um, <clears throat> I think we were seeing uh, just the starting off right around this time when the client computing 
was just taking off. That's when every household was starting to buy personal computers. Uh, I'm talking about desktop computers. And, um, and that started driving, this, keeping the semiconductor industry alive around the world, but also some of the companies that were making chips for high-end desktop computers, Intel being one of them, obviously. But then something interesting happened. As that market started, was about to saturate, you can kind of say, and at that time as a student, you don't know that, uh, what happened was that the mobile phone evolution, uh, the revolution started. At that time, I remember graduating out of, out of college, it was not obvious for a student to have a cell phone. It used to be called the flip phones. And that was a fancy item. And, uh, and pretty soon in my first year at Intel, I was given a pager, because if someone wants to get hold of you, uh, that's, the, that's how you actually contact that person, pager. I have not seen pager in a really, really long time. So the mobile phones obviously took off, <clears throat> and part of the reason for that, underlying technology is the digital CMOS technology, but also the RF CMOS technology. Because uh, by this time, already the transistors have gone to the scale where the analog or the RF performance of the transistor started coming up to the point that they can actually support the communication front end. But then, when the mobile phones were saturating, of course, Apple, Samsung, came up with uh, the smartphone revolutions. And you can see that a bunch of uh, technologies started intersecting together beyond digital RF CMOS. It was the plain, uh, planar NAND memory. I still remember interviewing with, uh, about to interview with two groups right off from my graduation. One was the Advanced Logic Technology Group in Oregon, and the other group was in Santa Clara, the Silicon Valley, which was the NAND, uh, sorry, the flash memory group. And that flash memory group at Intel was doing NOR flash. It's a different architecture. And nobody really bothered about NAND, because NAND means you're taking the transistors and connecting them in a, in a string, in a planar uh, configuration. And they were extremely slow. So people didn't even know what I'm going to use for. Because if I really want, at that time, we had hard disk. And uh, <clears throat> so nobody knew really know any, any application for NAND, except the fact that they're too darn slow. And uh, Norflash was a small business, and the business was not growing too much. So I didn't know, and all my friends were in Silicon Valley, so you know, one part of my brain was like, okay, let's stay in Silicon Valley, let's work for Intel in the Norflash group, or go to unknown Portland. I didn't have a friend, I didn't know anybody, and work on advanced logic. So I talked to a bunch of folks, and I flipped the coin, and off I was going, I, I, I had to return. I had to basically pay, uh, you know, this lease break, you know, penalty for breaking an early lease uh, earlier than what it should. And I, fil I was single, backed up my car and went to Oregon. So what, what ended up happening was that a couple of technologies started coming in. The NAND, it started really the NAND revolution was started by first iPod, but really NAND, uh, the, the smartphone business is what really drove. And once that happened, and the CMOS image sensor, of course, and so you start integrating all these functions together, and now we are talking about there is nothing really that replaces smartphones today. Maybe Vision Pro and other headsets will eventually get there, but not there yet. So that drove a lot of the semiconductor business. It's starting to kind of saturate. And right when we think that, okay, we have enough, we have enough semiconductor capacity around the world, out comes AI out comes this need for like an exponential number of GPUs and high-speed uh, uh, high memory, high bandwidth DRAM, as well as processors, FPGAs, and accelerators. So what I'm trying to tell you, the take-home message from this chart is, if you think that the world will ever run out of semiconductors, or we'll say we have enough semiconductors, probably you're gonna be mistaken because one and other application, killer application is gonna come in and drive this industry forward. So a trillion dollar industry, 2030, it's possible. It's not completely. Um, <clears throat> so let me just start still with Moore's Law. I know much has been said about the demise of Moore's Law. I've been hearing that since I graduated. Moore's Law is dead, it's time to move on. But the reality is that Moore's Law, if you actually read the paper by Gordon Moore, from 1965, what he was talking about was always about cost. 
Of course, there's other technical aspects of it as, uh, as you scale the transistors, I will get into that. But I think that there, it was mostly an economics law. And, uh, and the economics actually makes sense that as the technology evolves towards production of larger and larger circuit functions, it's a very important, on a single semiconductor substrate, she was talking about monolithic, you actually drive that cost curve in the right direction. <clears throat> and that's what leads to this tremendous amount of commercial uh, adoption. So integrated circuits is equal to lower cost for function, right? And I will address towards the end of this that we are also talking about disintegration we are kind of going back in some sense, and, uh, and there are some good reasons for that. We'll touch about that. So um, <clears throat> lower cost for function is ultimately what sustains a business. If you can deliver that, you have a business model that you can defend. <clears throat> now, uh, what started off that many of you have uh, seen in textbook is about the classical laws of CMOS scaling. It's a cross-section of a transistor with gate, source, and drain. Uh, the dotted line is something we electrical engineers talk about, depletion region, things like of that sort. Basically, you're trying to design the transistor in an electrostatically very robust fashion. And in order to do that and then do the scaling, uh, what you have to do is follow some rules, follow some guidelines, okay? And that's what uh, ultimate, uh, Bob Denard from IBM uh, first came up with this thing. And there was a memorial paper in honor of uh, Bob uh, in the proceedings of IEEE, very nice paper to read. And uh, <clears throat> the beauty of this, uh, following these rules of Denard scaling is, as you shrink the, the gate length and the great width of the transistor, uh, and you increase the, the doping level, you scale the gate oxide, which was very nice part of it, then you can actually scale the voltage concurrently with the transistor. And if you can scale the voltage and still continue to shrink and deliver that performance, then everything falls into place. And that's what he was basically talking about. This is Bob's uh, portrait, that um, ultimately your kappa is 1.4, so you can actually reduce the delay time, which means transistor runs faster, lower the delay time means that the speed of the transistor goes up and the circuit, function, uh, the circuit speed goes up. And also uh, you have these, but the more important thing is also the power dissipation. So the power dissipation going down was an important driver from the technology side, because now you can add more and more transistors every generation and still stay within that same power budget, right? And, uh, and that is something that is breaking down uh, today. And we have to do a lot more work than what Denard uh, was just suggesting in order to keep our, within our power envelope, because if chips, we, we have only a certain capability to extract certain amount of heat per centimeter square. It's not so much the total power, but it's also the power density. So all this scaling factor nicely adds up to the point that the power density stays as unity as you continue to scale the technology. <clears throat> all right, just to give you a sense of, I love this, uh, this uh, uh, from, uh, from Intel, uh, one of their presentations, is that uh, back in 1978, this whole cross-section area, it's a top-down image, was basically a single contact, a metal contact that lands on a transistor. And this is not even a state of the art, this is quite old, now 22 nanometer SRAM. And that's the size of that SRAM, which is six transistor cells with a bunch of contacts, internal metal routing that fits in scale of 1970. Just a visual representation of where things have come in the last three decades. In fact, I was just doing the numbers, almost a thousand SRAM cells so 6,000 transistors, roughly speaking, can fit within that one contact area of a 1970 technology node. So uh, when I started, I joined Intel in 2000, and one of the first thing, I joined the transistor and group, and the question that we were always asked is, this, how small can we go, right? That's a very obvious question. This is working, we're making money, so now the question is, how small can we go? Okay, is it 10 nanometer, is it single digit nanometer? So this was a transistor we built circa 2002, and we published in our Intel Technology Journal, just like IBM has an uh, IBM Technology Journal. And it was a 10 nanometer transistor. These are the measured output characteristics, kind of look like a transistor. But uh, if you're familiar with looking at uh, uh, transistors, you will see that there's some problem with these output characteristics. First of all, even though it shows, it behaves more like a gate, what I call a gate control resistor, than actually a transistor. And why is that? 
The reason is that you can see that it's not saturating properly. You know, a transistor is not a switch. It ultimately has to act as an amplifier. And for that, it's very important for the transistor to show saturation, which is tried to the electrostatics of the device. The other problem was when you lowered the gate voltage to zero volt, you actually wanted to cut off the transistor, completely shut off the current. But you can see even in linear scale, there's a current flowing through that. So the answer was yes, if you want to make a 10 nanometer transistor, and just write a paper, yes, you can, but you're not going to make any useful circuits out of that, okay? If you can't make any useful circuits out of that, there's no product, right? So it was very clear to us that that building these kind of getting to these dimensions, we have to do a lot more than, than just traditional scaling. And part of the issue was the following, that if you actually want to control the electrostatics of a, such a small transistor, you have to actually scale the, the gate oxide because you want to have very strong capacitive coupling from the gate electrode into the channel to hold the channel, to turn it on and turn it off. You have to put a lot of doping still, counter doping in the channel so that you don't, those depletion regions can touch each other and cause a punch through. So that means there is no barrier, potential barrier. So they will actually, the current will flow away from the gate, right? So if you, even though your gate has a control, the gate has only control over this part. So you're gonna get a lot of subsurface leakage and our transistors suffer from that. The other problem was that as soon as you put so much doping in this thing, you will create a lot more scattering. So your impurity and as impurity scattering, so your transistor drive current is gonna be low. So it's not gonna be a high performance solution. So it's just a small transistor, but there's no other use for it. <clears throat> so right around that time, it was very clear that, um, that we are gonna have some real challenges set up for us in order to continue that scaling. And uh, fortunately, uh, at that point of time, we were just gonna enter the 90 nanometer node and uh, a series of innovations happened. And uh, it's very, uh, very rare that you work in a lab on multiple, multiple things. You evaluate pretty much all the options, but so very few options ultimately make it to a real technology and a real product. So fortunately, that was a period of uh, very strong effort uh, where uh, the first thing was the strain technology. And I will tell you there was a little bit of a serendipity. Actually, with many of these things, there was a serendipity factor. And uh, there were surprises, good surprises. And uh, then came the high ML gate. And then came the, the tri-gate slash uh, FinFET technology. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you that ultimately the drive current of a transistor is related to the dimensions of the transistor. It's related to the, what we refer to as a mobility. There's a lot of physics that's hiding under the term. It is related to the gate oxide capacitance that creates the strong coupling between the voltage you apply on the gate and the channel. And then there is the supply voltage of operation. So typically what we are trying to do is, we cannot increase the width, right? Because that would be reverse scaling, right? We want to shrink things. So you have to compensate for that by either increasing the mobility or increasing the C-ox, that means make the oxide thinner and thinner, but eventually you run into gate leakage. And then you want to drop the supply voltage, right? Because you want to drive, turn on and turn off this transistor with applying as little voltage as possible. You will see that all these innovations literally targeted one or three of these factors. And that's, that's as simple as that. But there's a lot of engineering and a lot of scientific breakthroughs that goes into doing that stuff. I'll try to take you through some of them. The first one was related to what we refer to as uniaxial local strain. This was my first uh, brush with the mechanical engineers to try to basically figure out that is it possible in an integrated circuit where the NMOS and the PMOS complementary transistors are right next to each other, that you can actually do a opposite type of strain, one compressive strain for PMOS and tensile strain for NMOS. So it just so happens that mother nature, at least um, in this configuration of silicon with 100 orientation looking up, that uniaxial compressive strain really helps home mobility. Because if you look at uh, a textbook, introductory, so it's a textbook, we tell you about holes, the valence band of holes, and we talk about light holes and heavy holes that we kind of, uh, you know, brush aside, but that was where the physics was. As soon as you turn on a comp uniaxial compressive strain, you lift the degeneracy between light hole and heavy hole and make heavy hole light hole like, and that lowers the effective mass and actually increases the hole mobility. The question was that, okay, 
you know, the normal, the traditional approach was to create a virtual substrate, epithaxially grow something that is compressively strained. People have done that. And then you actually improve the PMOS mobility. But if you do that, the same compressive strain will appear on the NMOS side because it's a universal strain. And then what will happen is the electron mobility will go down. So we will improve PMOS performance, but you will actually decrease NMOS performance. So we have to come up with an alternate strategy where the, the electrons actually like exactly the opposite thing. It's, I call it the law of conservation of trouble. You solve one problem and then you create another problem in your life, which is that these guys want this uniaxial tensile strength. So anyway, the main thing that came up with it after a lot of experiments was this way to actually use a compressively strained silicon germanium because silicon germanium has a larger lattice constant, embedded, it tries to expand out, and when it tries to expand out from both sides, it exerts this compressive strain at this channel. But that was done only selectively for PMOS. On the NMOS side, what was done was create a very high stress film, a nitride film on top of the gate, and that, like a serene wrap, is trying to expand out, and as it tries to expand out, it starts pulling out here and pulling out here. So you take advantage of this topography of the drain and try to actually engineer the strain locally. That was the key, key breakthrough that Intel came up with, and of course, everybody adopted this thing. It was to increase the effective mobility of the transistors. Once you identify that, that knob, then you can see that the first type of devices that were introduced are 90 nanometer node, the shape of the silicon germanium and the concentration of the germanium in that SIGI was about 18%, it was a U shape. And see, by the time it went to 45 nanometer, it, was point, it had a much more pointed look because that was creating that uniaxial compressive strain in a much more effective way. You can see that the germanium percentage increased from 18 to 30%, so you cannot relax the film. So there was a lot of material science went into this work to actually enhance, and the PMOS drive current just kept going up and up and up. Now, of course, we have gone back to not doing planar, but we'll talk about this uh, 3D geometry. What you see here is that the, right now in state-of-the-art transistors, the one that you're using in your latest, greatest devices, germanium could be as high as 55%. So it's almost more, more germanium percentage than the, than the silicon percentages. The next big one uh, that happened in our industry was related to, again, transistor scaling, but in order to scale the transistor, you have to scale the gate oxide. And we were at a point in our gate oxide, uh, even in back in uh, 2000 or early 2000, where the thickness of silicon dioxide was already approaching about three monolayers, three monolayers, no more than 12 angstrom, right? So if you try to go below 12 angstrom, typically what happens is, you get a lot of quantum mechanical leakage. Basically, it's a tunneling, direct tunneling, that the channel electrons will tunnel right through that gate oxide, reach the gate electron, so you get a lot of leakage current, gate leakage. And the circuit designer said, we, can, we cannot actually, it, it affects the circuit operation, basically, because it's, you're not using it as a voltage control, high impedance, looking into the gate. So, uh, so what started off with is that replacing um, silicon dioxide with a higher dielectric constant material. Very obvious thing to do. So if you have a SiO2 with a dielectric constant of four, you replace it with high K, which has a dielectric constant, let's say, of tw you know, 20 or so, so you get a factor of five increase, which means you can deliver electrically the same oxide thickness with five times thicker dielectric. That was the idea. Well, of course, I'm not gonna make it five times thicker. Maybe I'll make it three times thicker. So I go from 12 angstrom to 30, 30 or so angstrom. In reality, so that was the work on high K. Now, as soon as, uh, so the idea of high K dielectric was to actually go after this oxide capacitance, C ox, in that transistor equation. Now, this was one of my favorite curves because I was a fairly young engineer, and you read a paper like this thing coming up from Saito San in, um, in, the, in the electron device meeting in DC back in 2003. This was the early days of high K. And you look at this picture, and you see basically what he was trying to point out, all the things that are gonna go wrong, as soon as you take amorphous silicon dioxide out and drop in your high K dielectric. And the one that I will point out, and he was absolutely right, all these problems have to be solved. But the ones that was the biggest problem that we ran into was this business called remote phonon. 
And this is where I always tell students to pay attention to device physics. Remote phonons is interesting uh, concept that we thought, you know, we ignored it, is that what makes ultimately a high K, a material high K? It is related to the polarizability of the bonds that are constituting this material. So when, you, when we switch from SiO to HFO, half name oxygen bonds, it was easily polar, polarizable. But that dipole also has very soft phonon modes that can easily couple to the electrons that are sitting right in that inversion channel next to, that, um, uh, next to the gate stack. So as soon as that happens, what you will see, there's a lot of extra scattering now you've introduced in the process. Back to that law of conservation of trouble because now that mobility of the electron is gonna go down. So you have to do, but it looked very fundamental. This was the one, everything else we can engineer, come up with very nice engineering ways, but this looked very fundamental, right? <coughs> Turns out that there was a way around that. And uh, what we found, this was a very nice from um, uh, theoretical work initially from Rosa, and then we did the, uh, the experiment uh, to show that indeed this theory kind of works, is to replace what we call, we skip the silicon channel, we keep the electric, but we also we used to use the polysilicon gate. That was obvious thing to do, because back days we were using polysilicon as the gate dielectric, so you don't change too many things, you keep the polysilicon gate, you take out the SRD, you put in the HFO2. Turns out this, this uh, remote phonon, you can think of it as, a, as an oscillating dipole, and that's just going, <coughs> with in-plane, this is the in-plane mode that we were particularly worried about. But what happens in a polysilicon gate, because it, it is depleted when you apply a positive gate voltage, the depletion region here, uh, <clears throat> you are actually uh, end up with a situation where the, there's a phase lag in the, in the electrons that are sitting in the polysilicon gate. This is a collective kind of a phenomenon. You can think of it as a bunch of electrons in the gate acting as a plasma, not like individual electron. And uh, because of the low concentration of electrons in the polysilicon gate, they were actually, the dipole had a phase lag. So in, in other words, they were actually adding on to the high the electric dipole, and the net effective dipole that the electrons were seeing was actually enhanced. On the other hand, if you actually use a metal gate, and this works only if your high dielectric is thin enough. This is not gonna work if you make it 30 angstrom thick. So uh, for thin enough high dielectric, this metal gate actually can respond with a higher frequency. And if you have remember one of your uh, high school or freshman physics, if you have a charge and you have an infinite plane, a, a metal plane, then it can indu induce an image charge on the gate. But this is a, not a static phenomena, this is a dynamic phenomena. So what we found was this image dipole can actually partially complete, not take it out completely, but partially uh, cancel this uh, high K phonon. And the effect, what we saw was that it can potentially mitigate, not eliminate, but mitigate. So after that, when we did these experiments with, uh, with uh, you know, when we first went from silicon dioxide polysilicon to high K polysilicon, we saw a huge drop in this electron mobility. These are measured you build the transistors, you measure, extract the mobility. But then when we actually switch from polysilicon to mid-gap, this tinitride, this was just a, ultimately we didn't use mid-gap work function tinitride, that's a different story. But, uh, but you could see that you can recover almost 50, 60% of that degradation. But then there was another knob that we already had at our disposal, which was the strain. We already knew how to engineer the strain from the silicon channel. So once you put that back together, high K, mid cap tinitrate strain, then we could actually recover not only full mobility degradation, but actually you can provide that enhancement. So what is the lesson here? The lesson here is in technology, you're not throwing away anything, you build. You basically stand on the shoulders of the giants to create the next most incredible technology. Turns out that high K gate was one of the most if high ML gate did not happen in planar CMOS, we would not see FinFETs today. And that's, uh, you know, maybe later on we can talk about that. But sometimes when you work hard enough, I tell my students, Mother Nature starts working with you. And this is, uh, and this is what I call serendipity. Serendipity is not luck. It's not like going to Vegas. It is about being at the right place at the right time with the right training. Okay, so all these things have to come together. And this is what happened to us also 
we realized that in order to actually make this metal gate and high K process to work with the right work function of the two metal gates to target the threshold voltage of NMOS and PMOS, we could not do that with the conventional transistor processing. What was the trans conventional processing? Conventional processing means you define the gate for both N and P, and then you do a self-align, maybe a spacer, and a self-align implant and activation of the source and drain regions. That high temperature process is a big problem for these metal gates. Not necessarily they will melt or anything, but it will shift the work function because some very complicated dipole, interface dipoles that show up when you go through those high temperature steps. So what did we have to, so what we had to do was to come back, start with a dummy's gate, finish all your high temperature source and drain activation process, come back, polish off, so that we had to work with uh, CMP people who have never seen how to stop within 100 nanometers. They said that CMP is sandpaper essentially, right? This is the first time we asked that we challenged them to come up with a polishing module where they can stop on a dime with 50 nanometer of, otherwise you're gonna polish off that entire gate, right? Or you're gonna leave something unpolished. So anyway, that was the poly opening polish. You can see that. Then we rip off with a selective wet edge. We take off that polysilicon and then we fill it with the metal. Source and drain already in place, so you avoid that high temperature step. Now what happened was, as soon as we did that, we saw that for PMOS, you remember your source and drain, the silicon germanium source drain were already there. As soon as you take this thing off, you expose a free surface, and this silicon starts, the SIGI source drain, the silicon germanium source drain start pressing even, even stronger. So what we found was that the PMOS the strain actually, that's uniaxial compressive strain, got enhanced because of this integration flow. It had nothing to do with high K or the metal gate. So this is what I say, but you have to watch out for these, these kind of uh, minute effects, which can make a big difference. You can get a 30% jump in your transistor performance, which is almost like two generations of scanning. So that's what was used. <clears throat> the next big change that we saw was um, uh, coming from that I always say even super thin gate stack cannot control leakage path that are far away from the, from the drain. So this is, goes back to maintaining the electrostatic robustness of the transistor. It's not just making a small device, right? Uh, that we know, that we knew all the time. So now how do you actually go there? Basically the idea at that time that was floating around from academia definitely was uh, if one gate is not strong enough, let's make multiple gates. Makes sense. And at that time, we were, I think it was around Christmas time, we were getting ready and uh, was making these slides. At that time, we were just figuring out that there are these options. So in the industry, when you're making technology decisions, it's not for publishing. You're making technology decisions with the, with the goal of ultimate productization. So once you choose something, you're kind of stuck with it. There's not a, not a way to you know, dial back and start all over again because your competitors, if they have made the right choice, you're in a hole. <clears throat> so one idea that was coming out from IBM was that if you cannot control the leakage path away from the gate, then why don't you put a buried oxide, aka SOI, silicon on insulator. So you make a silicon on insulator, you have a buried oxide, and you make this body of the silicon as thin as possible, okay? So that way you don't have to worry about those leakage currents. The issue was that in order to make this device, you can cut off the actual leakage path, but the issue was that the drain, when you turn on a drain voltage, that electric field cannot terminate because there is no charge, there's no ground plane. So that electric field is gonna actually start curling around and even get closer and closer to the source and reduce what we refer to as a drain-induced potential barrier lowering. So even though you have cut off the leakage parts, you can still get leakage through that. Now, you can stop that by making this silicon channel as thin as possible. So IBM decided to then go in the direction of what is referred to as ETSOI. So if you go back to the literature in the mid, I would say 2005, 2006, you will see a lot of papers coming out on extremely thin SOI uh, technology. <clears throat> There was another option that people were at that time playing around with is that, hey, 
Why don't we make a double gate structure? This is gonna be better than this problem because now we have a thin silicon. I'm gonna pattern a gate at the bottom first. And then I'm gonna pattern the top and try to self-align the two, okay? That was one idea I think was coming from Europe. That was the planar double gate, but this was not a self-align. In fact, today you, you will see that we are kind of back to this thing with this gate all around nano sheet transistors. Sorry about that. So anyway, uh, long story short, uh, there was a third option that was called the FinFET uh, coming out of Berkeley. And uh, we felt at that point of time that this is sort of the architecture that seems to make sense for high volume manufacturing. But the big issue at that point was, now you're gonna make transistors not on a beautiful, nice silicon surface, you're gonna take a, you're gonna actually etch out this fence and you have to control the orientation uh, of this fence, the right crystal planes, and make sure your transport is, is strong enough. So, uh, uh, and the other question was that how do we actually integrate the high K metal gate stack, nobody knew at that time how to do that, how to uh, engineer the work function and target the threshold voltages. How do you do channel strain? Because it's one thing to do strain engineering on a planar surface, but how do you do that on a, on a vertical fin? So that was one challenge. Uh, you don't want to give that up. And uh, I'm so sorry, did I? Okay, <clears throat> thanks. And the, Every time I'm trying to point the pointer. Okay. So there was a lot of work that happened at that point of time. You need probably the best edge engineers you can get your hand on to just to create this fence with a sidewall roughness less than five angstrom. You're pr basically anything more than five angstrom of surface roughness will create scattering. I'm talking about angstrom, not nanometer. And, uh, and that will pretty much kill your transistor drive current. So that problem was solved. Uh, but the interesting part that we found was, uh, uh, I don't have time to get into that, is now most of your current is now conducted at on 110. Because this crystal plane that you have on the two sidewalls are no longer 100 like you have with the planar configuration. So 110 has a very different piezo resistance uh, property than 100 silicon because piezo resistance is a tensor, tensorial quantity. It depends on the crystal plane. So you go back, you engineer the strain all over again, and long story short, I can tell you for electrons, turns out that if you can actually put pressure vertically down, that will actually increase your electron mobility along the 110 because it's a transverse compressive strain, which is very different than that uniaxial tensile strain in the direction of current transport, that's what favors the electron mobility in these kind of 3D structures. Once again, what I want to highlight is this, you have to actually work on the mechanics of the structure connected to the electron transport in order to engineer these sort of devices. But there was another serendipitous surprise for us, good one again, which is that when we started making these devices, we also saw that there is this obvious factor of this 3D factor benefit. What is this 3D factor? Remember, we were actually scaling the transistor and reducing the width of the transistor on a planar. But now, if you think about FinFET, this is basically taking, still shrinking the footprint of the transistor, but you're going in the Z direction. And that opened up more Z. Of course, it comes with increased device capacitance, but there's a huge advantage of making a transistor where the effective width of the transistor is actually now going up instead of going down. And the most important part of that is related to what we do not talk about. Anybody who designs, let's say, an analog circuit, for example, an SRAM, or for example, a sense amplifier, knows how much you have to match. To a, if two identical transistors sitting next to each other, you want them as identical with each other as possible. Otherwise, it's very difficult to design an SRAM at those advanced nodes. So what happens was, look at what the sigma VT, this is the threshold voltage mismatch between two transistors from 130 to 32 nanometer, it was getting worse and worse and worse because we were shrinking the width of the individual transistor. We switched to FinFET and the, the threshold voltage mismatch is coming down, 
So this is one take home message that I want you to think about is that if I give you two technology where the blue <coughs> is actually a higher performance technology, look at the median, than the red, but the red has an error distribution and you talk to a product guy, they will actually take this red because by the time they have to guard bend and design around these slow corners, at a product level, they're not gonna see the benefit, okay? So what happened was this planar to non-planar transition actually brought us back a control on the variation, which was considered as one red brick wall that people were very worried about. So if you look at now the evolution of FinFETs, and this was uh, around the time uh, I, I left to join academia, uh, we started with this very low aspect ratio fence. And today we have aspect ratio fence where the height of the fin is about 53 nanometer and, uh, and the width of each fin is about five or six nanometer. So it's almost like one is to eight type of uh, dimensions. So where do we go from here? Uh, there is uh, most of the, this is a uh, number of transistors per millimeter square, busy plot. This was switching energy. One of the big advantage of scaling is that um, you can actually lower the energy consumption for the device. That's one, another reason why we scale amongst other things. So uh, if you look at where we are today, the industry, if you have an iPhone 15 or so, you're talking at that is built out of, the processor is built out of the three nanometer. Right around this time, Samsung is expecting to, to announce, I think they have, they have some processors, but not yielding enough high uh, uh, process yet, where we're gonna move to from FinFET to this gate all around GA nanosheet transistors. Going forward, people are in the R&D world, in the major industrial lab, they're actually now gonna, because ultimately you have to scale the, scale the footprint, there is no way around that. The transistor density has to go down because that's the cost per function kind of driving force. So now they're gonna stack the N channel on top of P channel. So keeping that gate all around nano shape. Typically we are talking about at least three, most likely four of these sheets. So it's not just single sheet, that won't work because of the width re reason. So I'm gonna now uh, talk a little bit about plenty of room at the bottom and what do I mean by bottom? So uh, one of the things you will say, this is a cross section, you can think of it as a cross section of a wafer where you have NMOS fins standing up, PMOS fins, this could be done for nano sheet as well, okay? And if you look at the tracks, ultimately I can shrink my transistors, but if my metals don't scale accordingly, then I cannot route those standard cells. So I have to design the standard cells, making sure I have enough input signal lines enough output signal lines, and also I have to make room for my VDD and VSS, the supply, uh, the supply rails. So, uh, so this is an area which is very uh, popular, which is design technology co-optimization. Uh, back in the days, people didn't worry about that. Process engineers never really thought about layouts, but right now process engineers, device engineers, and the circuit designers have to work together in one single room. And what you see is that going from FinFET to this nano sheet, one of the things that's happening is this, what we refer to as buried supply rails. So if you look at the, which I haven't talked about, the entire back end of the, of the integrated circuit, there are about 15, roughly speaking, 15 layers. And you will find mostly, uh, other than clocking, two types of uh, rolls for all that back end wires. These are, I don't know, several kilometers of wires just on a single die probably. One is for signal. You gotta bring in the signal, you gotta route the signals, and you gotta take out the results of the operation. The other big one is power delivery. You may have 100 billion transistors, but you gotta start thinking about how do you actually deliver power to each and every one of those transistors. So in the past, if you think about signal uh, wires, they're constantly switching. So the capacitive coupling between two adjacent wires is of paramount importance. So you can, if you can figure out how to make the wires like shorter height to reduce that coupling capacitance, even at the expense of resistance, you might be able to, to up to a certain point, can get away with it. But then there is another role for the back end, which is about power delivery. And when you're delivering power, that's not a switching. So there the resistance is of paramount importance. So at that point of time, you're gonna actually prefer wider or taller um, uh, uh, wires. So there is a fundamental conflict. 
So the idea was that, hey, can we decouple the two? Can we have the backend layers just dedicated to signal and we find an alternative way to deliver power from the backside? That's what actually driving a lot of these innovation where you have a buried VSS and buried VDD, okay? The bigger advantage, another advantage with that is you can actually shrink the, the standard cell because of the way you're actually bringing in this buried power rails. <clears throat> and that is applicable to NanoSheet as well as the uh, CFET. And uh, one of the things that uh, folks are already working on uh, for buried power rail, and this is my segue also uh, to talk about this other big revolution that's going on is in the area of heterogeneous integration, is the wafer bonding technology. So when we used to think about bonding, we used to talk about bond pitch in the range of tens of microns. Now with hybrid bonding, we are talking about single digit, maybe even going forward, sub single digit or sub micron bond pitch. That's where the industry is headed. In fact, in the lab, these guys can already demonstrate 0.7 type of micron bond pitch you know, for bonding to wafers because to match, they ultimately want to get to monolithic type of via pitch. So what's showing here is basically you take two wafers, you process first the front end of the wafer, uh, you uh, flip it, uh, tie, uh, bond it to a, to a handle wafer, and, uh, and then what you end up with is the, is the uh, next silicon wafer uh, where, you, uh, where you form your uh, power delivery sort of network. And that way you can see that the FinFETs are looking down now, right here, and these are these buried power rails that are directly connected to these big pads, which will be connected to the pins and to the PCB where you bring in the power. So this is all good, but you can see immediately two other problems you have to solve. The first problem is now you have very high aspect ratio through silicon vias. Intel refers to them as power vias. Some other people have other names for it. Uh, IMEC has a different name for it. And now you have to fill them up with metals. And sputtering is out of the question. So one of the areas in our in a previous centerized direct, uh, we were we were actually uh, uh, working on these ALD technique, which is electron enhanced ALD. So you actually, while you're doing your growth, you can actually shoot these electrons, create these nucleation sites, and you can do a bottom of fill. Basically, you are instead of having a you know conformal CVD type process, here you're actually doing a bottom of fill all the way to fill up these, and cobalt is a, is a great example because cobalt <coughs> in very narrow restricted geometries has a resistivity that's actually even could be better than copper. Uh, ruthenium is another story. Now one of the things I wanna point out is this divergence in scaling. So I've been talking to you all the merits of scaling, but there is something that's happening today which is what we refer to as divergence in scaling. So look at this y-axis is that from node to node to node, ideally I want to hit two because I'm scaling the width and the length by a factor of 0.7, so I get double the transistor density. The logic guys have been kind of trying to get to that. In fact, from seven to two nanometer node, they almost hit that factor of two. So logic density scaling, I would argue, is still alive. If you look at the SRAM, which is also almost 50% of the chip, SRAM is the static random access memory, each cell con uh, containing six transistors we started off with. You can see that we used to do about 1.7 or so, and now it is almost approaching, if you hit one, then there is no scaling. Then you're not actually shrinking the footprint of the SRAM cell. But it, you can see that the SRAM scaling has slowed down. And part of the reason why it has slowed down is that you need perfectly matched pair in order to design an SRAM cell. It's a cross-couple inverter. You have to have the perfect VTC characteristics for all your 100 billion cells that you're trying to, <clears throat> trying to do. So, but look at the other one. The one that is particularly <laughs> problematic is the analog mixed signal structures. And they have almost getting to the point they're not scaling. So what do we do? We would end up with a chip where we have a lot of, but a big chunk of the real estate is taken up by the, by the analog. So that's uh, sort of uh, fueling this other revolution that we are seeing, which is take, continue with the logic scaling, make a logic die, we can call it a chiplet, and then you have a, a node where you are not delivering the scaling and have SRAM and the analog mix signal, and then you figure out how to 
bond them, bring them as close to each other as possible. How close? That will depend on you know, your advanced packaging technique. The biggest challenge is, is the IO density, because at, now if you take a monolithic design, that has a very high bandwidth and extremely low latency connections between these blocks. Now you're going to desegregate them and try to put them off and reconstitute them. You have to support that IO density. And that's where a big challenge is today. And people are going forward and uh, it's not <coughs> moving. Power? OK, hopefully this will work. People are even talking about mix and match IP now. If I actually develop these advanced um, uh, packaging uh, 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 schemes, then potentially we can have logic one, logic two, SRAM, AMS, all done on separate nodes. <clears throat> one of the issues that we are focusing on as we move towards this so-called heterogeneous integration is this problem of increased challenges in power delivery. Sometimes we don't, we just take it for granted. Let me give you one example of how severe this problem is. So let's say we have these chiplets, okay, that have been assembled. And uh, many of these chiplets, uh, de depending on uh, what type of die, can be operating with different voltage domains, supply voltage domains. And uh, it's not uh, today, uh, uh, because you have now half a trillion transistors now in that single package. So it's not completely unprecedented that you might have 500 watts total power that you have to supply. If you have 500 watts to billions of transistors, here's the catch, operating at one volt, then just do the calculation for how much current I need to deliver through my, through my, to my pens. It comes down to about almost uh, 500 watts, one volt, 500 amps, half a kilo amp that you have to bring it through. Through those narrow, narrow vias. If I have to do that, I'm going to run into major IR drop. That's the first thing I will do, 10, 20, 15% of my, from my pad VDD, by the time I reach my transistor, my voltage has dropped. And the other part is this electromigration. I'm going to electromigrate out my wires. So this is a really, really tough problem. So what people are trying to talk about is that it's not just enough to have just backside power rails. We actually will need a power delivery network on chip. So one of the ideas that we are actually focusing on, and this gets just worse and worse as you go towards this vertical stacking of these chips, is, is there a way to do on-chip voltage conversion at the point of load? So instead of actually trying to do 12 volt to one volt on the package, do the 12 volt to one volt on the die itself. And this is the work that uh, we started after we arrived on Georgia Tech campus and using our clean room um, <coughs> out, uh, outside this wall is uh, to make these oxide power feds, we use um, uh, a tungsten doped indium oxide is our chosen material. It can go down at low temperature, which doesn't bother the front end of the, the very sensitive FEOL transistors. And we can make this enhancement mode and depletion mode. Basically, the idea is to make a switched capacitor DC-DC uh, voltage converter. So switch cap, essential idea is that you have a series of transistors and a series of transistors, and you take two phases of the clock cycle. In one phase, you turn on these transistors, and there's a flying capacitor. You dump a whole bunch of charge on that sw switch cap or that flying cap, and in the next phase of the clock cycle, you pull that charge out and deliver it to the outside load. What are the challenges? You need to make high-voltage transistors, depending on whether you want to go from 12 volt to 1 volt. And the next thing is need, you need a very high density uh, capacitor on chip, because otherwise the capacitor will take up pretty much the entire uh, real estate. So we have been having some success with um, these construct of a flying capacitor built monolithically uh, using these kind of super lattice type of constructs with uh, hafnium, zirconium oxide, alumina. Alu hafnium, zirconium oxide gives you that dielectric constant boost. Alumina basically is introduced only to suppress the leakage, because it has to be high density, but extremely low leakage. You don't want that charge to trickle out. And, uh, and then for the transistors, we are using this depletion mode and the enhancement mode devices, um, all monolithically integrated uh, on chip. <clears throat> One last thing that I want to do before I close out today is that uh, going forward, we are entering clearly the, the era of heterogeneous compute. It is not going to be the world that is dominated by CPU. 
It's not going to be just uh, or an ARM, whether it's x86 or it's ARM. The fact that NVIDIA stock valuation is now at 1.4 trillion US dollar is a testament that the industry is hungry for accelerators. And that's what you're kind of saying. This, this is the CPU dominated computing era that was dominated by Intel's and ARM's. And now we are getting into this GPU dominated computing era. And what has happened is it's just completely accelerated our computational need as mentioned or measured by petaflops per second or days, whichever way you want to uh, look at it. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, so the compute need is going on, which means we need more semiconductors and the right kind of semiconductors. So one of the things that we are also working on that it's not just the logic anymore. We have now applications where we could be compute dominated. You know, there are scientific computing where compute is still flops matters and CPU world can handle that. Uh, there your goal is to basically increase the throughput which is floating point operations per second. You just improve the logic. Then there is this another world where you will see that you are kind of data dominated. And that metric comes from this operational intensity which is how much floating point operations you can do normalized to the byte of data that you have to move around. So CPUs benefit from data that is locally, it's like spatially and temporally available. They have, they have some very sophisticated algorithms that we use for, with prefetching so the data is already there. So just keep cranking up the flops. On the other hand, there are applications where, particularly in the AI world, where we are mostly worried by the bandwidth and the latency. So you're constantly bringing in new data, right? So you're moving a lot of data around, this byte of data that's moving around, okay? So you move, it pushes you towards the left. At that point, what you're really talking about is dominated your actual throughput, which is what users care about, is core to cache bandwidth and core to DRAM bandwidth. So already the industry is moving in that direction with the available technologies. So for example, you will see that uh, Micron and Samsung and SK Hynix, the leading three memory providers of the world, they are taking these stacked high bandwidth DRAM memory and putting it close to the GPU using a silicon interposer. That's already happening. And these things are selling like hotcakes, particularly because of the certain popularity of large language models. That's what's driving NVIDIA stocks. <clears throat> the other option is on the extreme other side, that there is a need also for a 3D monolithic on-chip memory because that has the highest bandwidth. Here you can almost get to 10 or 100 terabit per second. Even with interposer, you're still talking about single digit terabit per second bandwidth. So ideally we would like something right on chip to keep going up, right? That's why if you look at AMD has a product called Vcash where they're actually using hybrid bonding to create layers of SRAM directly on top of the, their AMD CPU. So one of the things we are working on um, using the clean room down here is take advantage of our amorphous oxide semiconductor. The beauty of that uh, material is it has a three EV band gap. It goes down at low temperature and we can actually reduce the leakage of the transistor down to about a femtoamp ampere of leakage. So femtoampere is basically 10 to the minus 15. Ideally we would like to go to attoampere, 10 to the minus 18. You're literally dealing with a few electrons, losing a few electrons per, per second. You can do the math. But if you can do that, then you can actually get rid of the capacitor of the DRAM and just store the charge at the gate capacitance of a read transistor. But that's a very tiny charge. That charge will easily go out if this transistor is not completely cut off, okay? And that has to, you have to demonstrate this at 85 degrees C. So you need a transistor with extremely low leakage, almost like an open circuit. Uh, so we have had some, uh, um, some progress in this area where you see a transistor, this is, and we have since then improved this, 10 to the power 11 on-off ratio, 10 to the 11 orders of magnitude, all can be done on top of monolithic silicon and, uh, and essentially can give you for about seven femtofarad of stored, uh, storage capacitance, we can actually show about 100 seconds of retention. 100 seconds of retention, is that good enough? I think the answer is 100 seconds of uh, <laughs> retention is perfectly fine because we are going to keep refreshing the data. But the bigger question is, is the variation. What is the spread around this? 
in, the, in this axis. So ultimately, it comes down to whether you can make transistors and you really understand the source of variation in the device, not just the nominal transistor. The other important issue is uh, <coughs> related to, um, uh, I would say, reliability. So you can make a time zero transistor with a very tight variation, but as you keep stressing this thing, we have something called bias temperature instability. The threshold voltage will move because you create defects. Some defects are recoverable. Some defects are not, electrically active defects. The other area that is uh, highly, highly uh, in, um, uh, uh, or there's a lot of research work going on in academia and even in some industrial labs is that is there a way to move from digital to what we refer to as analog accelerators? And one idea is that let's not worry about moving data from memory to logic and back and forth rather do the computation within the memory itself. And that's one area with, where we also work a lot on is called computing memory. And you can do a digital computing memory or you can even do analog computing memory. So, uh, so one of the uh, ideas is that can we do this analog computing memory with some of these emerging memories? And this is where you will see, I, I'm gonna run out of time, uh, vector matrix multiplication is something, a kernel that's highly, highly used repeatedly for AI applications, both for training as well as inference. So people have been looking at all types of memory and uh, starting with magnetic random access, spin transfer torque, spin orbit torque, uh, ferrolactic, this is where we work in. So these are all, any of these candidates are totally viable for implementing these analog uh, compute in memory. One example I can give, this device was not built here. This was at Notre Dame before I just arrived is that we can actually make this back end of the line compatible ferroelectric FET on top of a front end, or that this was actually two layers, so two layers of ferrofed sitting on top of um, front end of the line uh, CMOS uh, transistors. And we were able to demonstrate a, a, a ternary cam cell. So people always ask me, should I be in computer science or should I still stay in electrical engineering? My answer is of course, follow your passion. You know, and, uh, but uh, if you go and take a look at where the performance gain over the last decade came from, what actually set, a, uh, set us up for this kind of success? Sometimes I think this is, this is actually, I adapted it from Lisa Su, who is the, uh, the, the CEO of AMD, very successful in the turnaround of AMD advanced micro devices in the recent years. And you will see that yes, there has been advantages from the architecture, compilers, power management, but if you actually look at the process technology, if you look at benefit of growing a bigger die, additional TDB, thermal design point, that I can operate this chip at a higher design point, this is particularly in the context of high performance computing, you will see almost like 60% is actually coming still from the process technology node over the last 10 decades. So I don't think this is a time for us to slow down. It's a time for us to actually accelerate, and hopefully um, we have less and less skilled people in our area. This is a huge, huge, huge concern for United States, but hopefully with CHIPS Act and things like that, uh, we will be able to turn the train around and attract more young, talented people in our area. So we have this performance improvement gap over all these other advancements that are happening, and this is where the action is. And, uh, and we will need uh, people not with the background in material science. We need people like device who understand logic, memory, and also uh, power delivery. Uh, there is a big aspect of design automation. Uh, if we go the route of taking a big die and then disaggregating it and then try to put it back together, we need to actually have a framework. Today there is no good framework for that. Uh, if you look at the EDA industry, the electronic design automation industry, you will see that Synopsys just recently bought ANSYS for $20 billion. That kind of gives you an idea that uh, finite element simulation, we have to actually tie that to the kind of uh, uh, design automation that we do with functional blocks, right? So they see a value in, in connecting these two. Basically, we are talking about a multi-physics, multi-scale simulation environment that allows designers to design these incredibly complex microsystems. So, you know, when we actually set up, a, a competed for Jump, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Swami Nathan, who used to run packaging research, he maybe had something to do with me because I arrived and I heard that Swami is leaving uh, for Penn State. But uh, fortunately, I'm part of that center out of Penn State. So, and uh, this is sort of the vision that uh, that's uh, going around that uh, 
you know, we might have reconfigurable interconnects, embedded memory, CMOS logic front end, another front end tier two, tier one, and all these backside power delivery network at the bottom. This is sort of the vision that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, created one of the large thrusts in his in Swami centers, and this is what uh, inspired me to make, name my talk. Uh, plenty of room, both at the top as well as the as the bottom. So a lot of work turned out for me. Is it going to be easy? Absolutely not. Nothing ever has been easy in this industry. But uh, I was landing in Boston, and I was uh, going to give this talk at MRS as the Kavli lecture, and I saw this picture. If you get to Boston Logan Airport and you come out. You see this quotation from uh, John F. Kennedy that uh, clearly shows we chose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And, and at some point, that's the right, that's the right choice. Uh, and so I would implore all the young people to really think hard about semiconductors and being in this field, because we have a lot of good stuff to do. Thank you. <clears throat> I know we're running a little bit late, but if there's maybe one quick question. All right. Eric. Very good talk, Suman. Thank you. So at, at sort of a high level, you talked about two integration paths. One is 3D chip stacking. One is monolithic integration. Yes. Is the big difference in choosing one of those paths cost? Um, so, I, so monolithic is definitely much better performance. So if you can do it monolithically, you should do it. But I assume that it's real, is it's it a really great, a cost question? Yeah, it's a great, great question. I would say <clears throat> I have actually thought about this thing, and I think this is a great uh, IEDM evening panel discussion. I was looking through the short courses uh, that we had at 2023 IEDM, and the one thing that is coming up for going the monolithic route, monolithic SOC route, versus breaking it up and then putting it back together. You still have to put it back together, um, especially for this application that we're talking about. It's going to be very application specific. But for this application, the advantage of cost will come if you have really disparate technologies. So let's think of it you're trying to combine a photonic domain to an electronic domain, that approach of assembly makes sense to me, okay? And I think most people are heading in that direction. If you're staying in the electronic domain, if you can do the monolithic SOC, that will not only give you the performance, but it will actually give you the cost as well, if you can do that. And the reason is that uh, for pure electronic to electronic interaction is the IO density, ultimately, and the latency. As soon as you go off or try to go off the chip, the kind of, v we're talking about VO density and we're talking about IO density. It's a huge gap between the two. That means they're fatter, they are longer, and that R and C combination is not gonna, it's hard to hide that latency. It's hard to, uh, uh, hide that energy per bit of transmission. So it's not clear to me that, um, that anytime soon you will see Apple's, small, you know, like M M4 or A16 chip, which is an ultimate monolithic SOC doing, having, uh, you know, GPUs and cores, logic cores, uh, they have analogs, they have NPU units, uh, neural processing units. I don't see that being disaggregated anytime soon because the, the, the performance as well as, you know, just the cost itself is going to be high because you need very fine pitch connection. So ultimately, I take it back to IO density. IO density and the latency. Um, now, that being said, if you look at the end of the, I ask the advanced packaging people that what is your end of the road, roadmap targets? We know that for our logic. We know that for our SRAM. We know that for our memory. And they want to get to that kind of dimension. We are talking about sub one micron hybrid bonds. So they want to actually get to almost our last level via. Yeah, if that can be done, sure. But it's gonna come with a, because basically see, today we have a monolithic IC and we sort it and we package it and we ship it. Here you have to first do the first level of sort, then you reconstitute them. 
And then you sort again. <laughs> So it's not clear to me. But if it's, if it's so, I was talking to Ravi Mahajan. I just came back from an Oregon workshop. <clears throat> and Ravi, who is, runs the Intel fellow. So Ravi's point is that if you go to heterogeneity, advanced packaging, it seems like the right direction. If, you're, if your technology becomes homogeneous, it's still transistors. Modi has also is still going to continue. If you want to do, exactly. But usually that's where we run into. But that, I mean, in, in fact, you're absolutely right. I mean, look at uh, STD MRAM. I mean, we, uh, it was not scaling initially. But uh, now Samsung uh, is talking about a 7 nanometer FinFET with, uh, with STD MRAM. STD is a very heterogeneous in that sense. But as long as it's, it goes down at a temperature, that doesn't upset my, I will do, I will still do monolithic. The other thing I heard, and we should think about it, is the time to market. Sometimes they're finding that I have a chip, I have a chip, and I, especially the photonics world, they don't scale their uh, technology as a because of the volume being much smaller. I think we have folks from GTRI, there, there are a lot more, uh, um, I think I met someone. So maybe it's easier to get it to market with the packaging, small number of small volume. So those kind of niche applications can still benefit. All right. Sorry to uh, disturb the conversation, and I'm sure Shuman will stick around if you have more questions. But in lieu of yeah. the time, I think let's thank him one more time and, and say goodbye. <laughs>